But the final breach came soon afterwards with a much more important bill, the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. This is one of the most important laws ever passed in American history. Civil Rights Act of 1866, another measure of Trumbull. Trumbull said, this is the way we will solve the problems of Johnson's governments, by enacting basic guarantees for the rights of the former slaves, which the states cannot override. Um, so what does, the Freedmen's, what does the Civil Rights Bill say? First of all, it, one might say that in some legal sense, the purpose of this bill is to overturn the Dred Scott decision and the Black Codes. The first thing it says is that any person born in the United States, except Native Americans who are in their own little sovereignties, are citizens of the United States. This is the principle we call birthright citizenship. Any, I'm going to talk more about this next time we get to the 14th Amendment, so just hold that idea. But the main point is, it doesn't say anything about race right there, but black people are citizens. Dred Scott is reversed. African Americans and anybody born in the United States. This is the first statutory definition of citizenship in American history. There had been talk of citizens, but there had been no definition of who is a citizen exactly. And of course, before the war, African Americans basically could not be citizens. All right, we have all these citizens. What rights do they have? Well, all these citizens must enjoy equality in certain rights. What are the rights? They are the rights of free labor, owning property, signing contracts, having access to courts, suing, testifying, being sued, protection of their persons. Doesn't mention the right to vote at all. This is the rights of economic activity in the marketplace. Now, interest, the language is very interesting. It does not quite say equal rights. What it says is, all citizens must enjoy these rights in a way equal to those of white persons. That's a very interesting language, use of language, equal to those of white persons. Before the war, the word white was used in legislation as a barrier, as a boundary. White people can vote. It's a way of excluding others. Now, whiteness is transformed into a baseline that everybody has to, if white people are enjoying this right, everyone else has to enjoy that right also. From a boundary, it, it shows you the transformation in thinking that has happened as a result of the Civil War and emancipation. The same rights as a white person. Now this means the black codes all are abrogated because they're putting penalties on blacks for not signing a contract, doesn't apply to whites, etc. Who is responsible for this? No state official or law can violate this principle of equality and the rights of free labor. But they also add a very interesting word, or custom. No law or custom in a state can deprive citizens of these basic rights. We will talk next time about this principle of state action, which is embedded in the 14th Amendment. But the Civil Rights Bill goes beyond state action, goes beyond the actions of states to customs, which are obviously actions of individuals. Now, they don't define that, but it opens the door to abrogating certain practices which may discriminate, even though they're not grounded in law. How is this to be enforced? Here's a great irony of this law. They draw on a pre-Civil War law which had sought, just like this, to enforce a constitutional guarantee against abrogation by states. And that previous law had explained how state officials, local officials, would be punished if they violated this national constitutional principle, how um, you could sue them, individuals could go to court and sue if this constitutional right is violated. What, what law am I talking about before the Civil War? Thank you. The fugitive. This is the great irony. Trumbull says, we are taking the weapon used to defend slavery and turning it into a weapon in favor of freedom. Great irony here. The fugitive slave law becomes the 
basis for the enforcement provisions. And let me say this, we are just in the midst right now of marking the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was one of the high points of the Civil Rights Movement. But the fact is that in terms of enforcement, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 is a stronger law. It took us 98 years to get to a point where another such law could be passed, and it's weaker than what they were able to do. That shows you something about what's going on in Reconstruction. Now, one other question. What gives, what provision of the Constitution gives Congress the right to tell the states what they must and must not do, to override? Or, by the way, this invalidates many laws in the North as well. There are plenty of discriminatory laws in the North that are abrogated by the Civil Rights Act of 1866. What provision of the Constitution gives them the right to do it? In the Fugitive Slave Law, it was the Fugitive Slave Clause. Very good. You're not right, but that's very good because that's what the Supreme Court will eventually, in its uh, lack of wisdom, latch on to for the Civil Rights Act of 18, uh, 1964. We'll see about that. But no, it's the 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment is now part of the Constitution. This is part of the abolition of slavery. This is the first legislative definition of what freedom is in America. You're not free if you just have the shackles broken off your leg. You are free if you can compete in the labor market. Free labor, in other words, is the definition of freedom. That's part of what the 13th Amendment is trying to implement. So they're saying that the Constitution has been changed by the 13th Amendment. It didn't just abolish chattel slavery. It, abo it, it opened the door to the former slaves as equal competitors in the marketplace. Nothing to do with the right to vote. No mention of the right to vote here. But nonetheless, but it, it's also, this bill, a powerful example of the nationalizing impulse that I have talked about coming out of the Civil War, right? Who is a citizen? Now there's a national standard, not state standards. The nation will decide who is a citizen, not individual states. And what are the rights of citizens? And the federal government exalted over the states. The federal government telling the states what they can and cannot do. The federal government becomes the protector of the rights of citizens, not the local governments. As Charles Sumner would say, the federal government is now the custodian of freedom. It's the states that are the danger to the rights of citizens, and the federal government must step in and make sure the states do not do that, as they have been doing through these black codes. So the Civil Rights Act of 1866 passes the Congress, and this is Johnson's opportunity, many people think. One of his supporters in the North, in Chicago, a Chicago editor, writes to Trumbull, a radical, Rice Trumbull said, if he agrees to your bill giving the freedmen the civil rights that whites enjoy, and if he halts at that and war is made upon him because he will not support Negro suffrage, he will beat everyone. If he says, okay, they can have these basic civil rights, but, if, but I'm not going to give them the right to vote, says Ray, most Northerners will say, okay. The moderates wanted the Civil Rights Bill very much. They thought this was the key to Reconstruction. Let the Johnson's government stay in place, but guarantee the basic rights of all uh, citizens. But Johnson vetoed it, just like he had vetoed the, civil, the, the other bill, the Freedmen's Bureau bill, again, citing states' rights. He said, this is a revolution in our jurisprudence, which is true, it was a revolution. Nothing remotely like this in terms of general rights of citizens had been enacted before the Civil War. Um, it uh, reverses discrimination. It establishes for the security of the colored race safeguards which go infinitely beyond anything the general government has ever provided for the white race. Johnson's veto message, some of it is in the Janap book. As I say, it's well worth reading because it anticipates many arguments which have flowed down in the century and a half since then against 
federal action to expand the rights of disadvantaged citizens. Not only African Americans, many different kinds of this notion of reverse discrimination against whites. That's Johnson's um, idea. Well, the veto cut the ground out from under the Republican moderates, right? They thought this was the solution. Now Johnson is giving them basically the, the choice. Go with me or go with the radicals. There is no middle ground. So the civil rights veto polarizes the Congress. It sets up a great struggle between Johnson and Congress over Reconstruction. It sets the stage for 1866 elections, pivotal in this. And it, was it, no one knew how the Northern Republic would respond. Did Johnson make a terrible mistake? Or did he choose the ground on which to fight, black suffrage, and think and assume that he would win? Well, we will see next time what happens, but it sets off one of the great political battles in American history.